morning, everybody. Great to have you all. Please find a seat if you're in the building and if you're at home, please also find a seat or stand. I don't care. What are you doing? Going for a walk? It's good to have you all here and present with us today. So thank you for coming with us. And um, yeah, let's stand and sing, shall we? Step out of the shadows, step out of the grave, look into the wild, and don't be afraid. Run into wide open spaces, races waiting for you. Dance like the weight has been lifted, races. Raiding. For the Spirit of the Lord is there is freedom, there is freedom. For the Spirit of the Lord is there is freedom, there is freedom. Come out of the dark just as you are into the fullness of His love. For the Spirit is here, let there be freedom. Let there be freedom Bring all of your burdens Bring all of your scars Come back to communion Come back to the start Run into wide open spaces, graces waiting for you. Dance like the weight has been lifted, graces waiting. For the Spirit of the Lord is there is freedom, there is freedom. For the Spirit of the Lord is there is freedom, there is freedom. Out of the dark, just as you are, into the fullness of His love. For the Spirit is here, let there be freedom. Let there be freedom. Chains will fall, prison shake at the sound of Jesus' name. Lives made whole, hearts awake at the sound of Jesus' name. Chains will fall, prison shake at the sound of Jesus' name. Lives made whole, hearts awake at the sound of Jesus' name. Chains will fall, prison shake at the sound of Jesus' name. Lives may hold, hearts awake at the sound of Jesus' name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, there is freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Come out of the dark, just as you are, into the fullness of His love. For the Spirit is here, let there be freedom, let there be freedom.
don't have Lauren here to organise this all, so me and Lex are like quickly communicating. How are we running the service today? I'll just do three songs. Yep.
Though your mercy never fails me All my days I've been held in your hand The moment that I wake up I lay my head I will see Of the goodness of God my life you have been faithful all my life you have been so so good every breath that I am able I will see of the goodness of God If this is your first time here, big welcome to you for all those online. Um, I'm, I am forever amazed at who we bump into in our little travels that are watching online and say to you they've been watching online and tell you stuff that's happening and people that will never walk in these doors or people that are actually looking for the first time before they ever walk in these doors. In fact, 
we had a board meeting in here on Thursday night and I said, we've got to get a stage. We've got to make it a high priority because um, those at the back when, like we had a big crowd here last Sunday and, and you couldn't see the band at, and poor Jolly sits down like you can't see him and he wants to be seen and so, um, so on Friday we got given a stage and it's a module thing, it can be bigger than this and it's worth quite a lot of money and it just, I just think, how does that work? Like God is so faithful and we just sung a little song about the goodness of God, the, the faithfulness of God and and it's just so true. So welcome, so good to have you here. Um, I was thinking about you this week and how that some of you live in homes that are always tidy. You're probably in the minority, but your house is always tidy. And if unexpected people come, you're ready. But see, our house, it sort of swings from like total out of control mess to tidy sometimes. And and when people you're not expecting come when it's not tidy, you feel like putting a little sign on the door, it was tidy yesterday. You know, you know that feeling, you think, why didn't you come yesterday? We were ready for you, right? But but the truth is that whether our houses are tidy or whether they are a mess, it's how people feel when they walk in, if they feel loved, if they feel valued. And, and I know some of you actually really enjoy cleaning up other people's messes. That's why you became a mother. Like, that's what attracted Coral to me. My wife, she just, she thought, for the rest of my life I can clean up after his mess. It's, it's just fantastic. Red gum is about to step into a season of fun. The reality is that we're still a construction site. Like, just, you only got to look that way, right? We, we've decided we're going to live in this thing. We're going to function out of here with all our mess. And each week we'll keep tweaking it. Each week we'll, we'll make it a little bit better. But we're going to live in it while it's a mess. <clears throat> and, and, and I know the fun's begun when you have guests, when you have visitors. And I have this, um, I have this image in my head of an outback cattle station. And it's remote. And the kids are playing outside in the dust. And a car drives up. And the kids run back to the homestead yelling, visitors, visitors, visitors. Because new people... It's exciting. Their stories. They're, everyone have a story. You all have stories, and and even though we're a mess, and like last week, the sound was bouncing around off that back wall there, and someone contacted my brother Jeff and just said, "Look, it it really wasn't a good experience last week with the, the way the sound was bouncing around." Now in church life, people sometimes complain. Was that you, Philip, being naughty, was it? So, but this person, they brought to our attention a problem. Now, I don't know who this person is, but then they gave a significant amount of money to fixing the problem. Isn't that gold? Isn't that, isn't that just gold? Where someone goes, this is the truth, but I want to be part of a solution. And I just love that. And, and when you walk in here for the first time now... This week, I knew that so many would be away. My wife is away. Our, our youngest daughter, her and her husband are taking on the, the pastor role of a church plant in Sale. And so it's their little induction this morning. And Mandy and Aaron and the kids, they're all down there, right? And, and there's people away. But whatever happens this morning, I want you to feel loved and valued being here. Now... We won't always get that right. Some of our, our key people that are real welcomers may not be here. So if you're here for the first time, just welcome someone near you so they won't know if they're new either. You know, just, you just, just smile at someone, right? But, but that's God's heart that we feel loved 
and valued. And over the next 18 months, we're going to really grow significantly because all the resources of heaven are available to people that will be welcoming to new people, that will, will embrace new people, that will welcome people that are here all the time, right? That, that's how it works as humans. We enjoy that. And, and last week there was this buzz in the room with, with new people and, and, and that's going to continue. And, and so we're going to go through a season of fun and, and I, I, I want you to, to understand that it doesn't happen by itself, but it's going to happen. And, and, and I know that last week there were people that were invited that didn't come. But for those that did invite someone, when they walked in the door last week, you were so excited because you care about them and you want them to experience the best of what God has in village life, in, in a church, in his bride. You, you want them to be part of that. Someone last week came for the first time and they brought this little pot plant at the back there it, it, it's like a little indoor plant and now we've got to water the thing <laughs> but isn't that amazing that someone would do that just at first time here and they brought a plant with them we could grow a whole forest over the next 18 months if everyone did that right um, but what I loved about last week was Artie who was from India born in India told a story and she was so honest and she was so vulnerable. And, and she asked this question, who would I be without Jesus? And, it was, and she answered the question. And it's a great question to ask, who would I be without Jesus? Or who have I become because of Jesus? See, 30 years ago, I was a broken, hurting failure. I'd, we had lost everything we owned and, and we'd lost a thousand acre farm, this big new house that we'd built. We lost everything we owned. But it wasn't what we lost that was the pain. It was the, it was the dreams. It was the vision. It was the future. It was, it was what I'd been building towards. And three nights in a row, God recommissioned this failure back to what I was created for. We'd been part of a youth ministry. We'd, we'd sown our lives into kids and I walked away feeling that I wanted to build my own little empire. And when it all collapsed, God recommissioned me. You know, like he, 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 one of his disciples, Peter, had really messed up and Jesus, on a little shore over breakfast one morning, said, Pete, do you, do you, really, do you really love me? And three times he asked him, three times he gave him a job. He recommissioned him. And, and that's what God did this night, three nights in a row, one after another. And he did it from a story he told in Luke 14. And if it wasn't for this story that Jesus told and how he's used it in my life, I wouldn't be here this morning my whole life would be completely different. My family's life would be completely and absolutely different. There would not be a red gum church. You would be sitting somewhere else. You, you would be, our lives would not intersect except for this story that Jesus told in Luke 14. And as he sets this story up, Jesus begins with, there's a venue booked, there's a band, the, the caterers have been all organised, the food's been paid for, and it's a story of this great banquet. And nobody comes. It's a no-show. All the guests that have been invited don't come. And they, they all start sending these texts and emails and, and, and excuses for why they couldn't come to this banquet. And the host of this banquet, it, it gets him emotionally. It, it really upsets him. The Bible uses the word exasperated. He, he, he has this emotional response, this exasperation, because he knows the guests haven't come because they don't want to be there. They really don't want to be there. And so he switches 
to a new strategy. And there's an urgency, there's, there's, a, there's a, a hurriedness about it because he's determined that this banquet is going to go on. Now those listening to Jesus this day, when they heard of this new strategy, they must have been shocked to their core. It was so foreign to their way of thinking. Now, I I don't want you to miss this. The new strategy moved from inviting to inspiring. See, invitations don't work. Like, we're all busy. We We can all make excuses. We can all ignore an invitation to something. You just send a text, an apology. But for this new strategy, you could not ignore it. Because it involved going out and leading in. Now, the NIV doesn't take that Greek word and translate it leading in, in the story. It translates it bringing in. And most translations have the words about he sent this, the servants to go out and bring in. But, but the Strong's Concordance says that the real true meaning of that Greek word is to lead in. And, I, and I'll tell you why it's important. Because you'll only let people lead you who you trust, who inspire you, who you want to lead you somewhere. And it worked. And, and, and all these people came. Many, many, many people, but... But then there was still room in the banquet. And in telling this story, Jesus gets it to an intensity at the end of the story, the final instructions of the host. And, and the host gives this final instructions to the servants. He says, go out to the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house would be full. House means household. It's family. And compel, that, that, that sounds like a, a pretty strong word. And the NIV actually says, make them come in. And, and other translations use the word urge, constrain, persuade. I'm actually thinking this morning, Paul, you're doing really well. Because I know how soft that seat is. And you're still awake. I'm really impressed, like I'm seriously impressed. You're doing great, really good. Here's the thing. All those who were invited the first time were free to say no, to make excuses, and they did. And all those who were invited under the new strategy were just as free to say no, but they did didn't they came because someone personally went to them and inspired them and they inspired them with this a potential life experience that was better than their current reality when when god changed the course of my life through this story he painted a picture of a different tomorrow he painted a picture of a youth ministry that we would go and, and he gave me purpose again and he gave me direction again in my life and he recommissioned me from walking away from youth ministry to going back to youth ministry. And some days after, and this all took place in early 92, some days after I felt God calling me back to youth ministry and he gave me a blueprint for how it would work. Um, you're part of that, Charlie. You're part of that. And I was driving into Bensdale one day, and I can show you the spot on the road, and it was like God gave me, and I, I struggle using the word, but like a vision of the future. And at the time, I had this dream to breed the best Angora goats in the world. And we'd imported ones from Texas and we did a whole lot of things and we lost everything we owned and in the pursuit of this dream. But I knew that I could get back into it again. And in this vision, it was like Jesus was returning and I could look back down 
on my life's work. And I could look down at little nice little goat sheds and little mobs of angora goats in these paddocks. Or I could see, as Jesus returned, all these young people going up to meet him in the sky. It changed me because Jesus gave me a vision of a different tomorrow. He inspired me. See, invitations are about information, time, date, place. There's an event. But information does not inspire. When, um, when our girls were little, I've got two girls, and Coral had gone away for a couple of days to a, a ladies' retreat. I don't know what they do with those things. But they retreat. <laughs> and I'm left to look after the kids. What does a good Aussie dad cook his kids for a meal? Meat. That's it. Chops. Big fat lamb chops that you butchered yourself that are about this long. And you, and you just every meal, three meals, chops. No veggies, just here kids, breakfast, chops. <laughs> and, and what do you do when you're looking after your two kids and your wife's away? You let the dishes stack up as high as you can get them until every cupboard has got all the clean dishes are gone. you just got dirty ones on the sink. And they're really greasy from the chops. I think the chops were still sitting there. And, and the benches, the kitchen was a mess. And I knew that Coral would be coming back in a few hours' time. Now, I could have said to the girls, hey, girls, your mum's coming home. She'll be home at four o'clock. I want you to wash the dishes and dry the dishes. Do you know what? I have invited them to an event, dishwashing. I've given them information that their mum's coming home. And do you know what they would have done? Made excuses. And they would have whinged and complained and, and not wanted to do it. So this was one of my good moments in my fathering. I could tell you a lot of bad moments, but this is, this is one of my good ones, right? I said to my girls, hey, girls... Imagine in three hours' time when Coral walks through the door and the bench is clean. It's all wiped down. All the dishes are washed and we've vacuumed it. And do you know what? I reckon we could get some flowers, steal some flowers out of the garden. She won't know. Put them in a little vase. And when she walks in, imagine how she will feel. And they went, oh, Dad, that's fantastic. Can we help? And my two girls that normally fight with each other and complain for three hours. They made that kitchen look amazing. And when Coral walked in, she cried. It was happy tears, right? To, to see what her girls had done. Now, I could have just made them do it, their kids. I could have guilted them into it. I could have said, if your mum walks in here and sees this, imagine how upset she's going to be and disappointed. I, but see, guilt may work for a moment but long time long term it's a disaster and 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 some bibles have the words of jesus written in red and if you read them you'll find that jesus never ever ever uses guilt he always inspires always there was a man that had lived as an invalid for 38 years and when Jesus found him he asked him a question do you want to be well he, he see he's offering him a different tomorrow he, he's, he's painting a picture of something way better than what this man has known for 38 years of his life see he, Jesus is, is painting a, a picture of a better tomorrow and he's inviting him to a banquet where the broken are made whole. And Jesus took the initiative. He found him. He went to him. And inspiration begins with someone taking the initiative, going out, leading in, compelling, 
urging, and it flows out of a heart of compassion and care for the person that you're going to, that you're inspiring. And after 38 years of never being healed, all this man was left with was excuses of why he couldn't be, why he was the way he was. And it's a mistake to argue with people's excuses. Someone was here last Sunday and they said to me, I don't believe in God. I said, I don't care. Because we both agreed it was an excuse. I'm not going to argue with them to prove God. That's irrelevant. It's just an excuse. And so this, this man, Jesus didn't engage with his, with his excuses. He didn't get drawn to that. He, he simply and profoundly he healed him. When's the last time you were shocked by something that you actually heard? Someone told you something and you went, oh, and you were really shocked. See, the day that Jesus spoke of this great banquet, life moved at walking pace. Like, internet coverage in Jerusalem back in those days was worse than this here in Bansdale, right? And, and they didn't know anything of missiles hitting Poland. They didn't know anything that was happening around the world. They, they, they were insulated. And, and, and so we don't get shocked very easily because we get exposed probably to way, way too much. But, but the crowd that was listening to Jesus this day... They lived sheltered lives. They followed customs and traditions that were handed down for hundreds and hundreds of years. And, and no one challenged the social norms. And the cultural expectations, they stayed the same generation after generation after generation. So how you do invitations for a banquet, a wedding feast, they were so well established. And, and switching... What Jesus did telling the story, switching to this new strategy of going out and leading in, that messed with everything they knew. But what Jesus did next blew the whole thing apart. One day in the near future, we will paint this building. We will have a big tree painted on the side of that building there for everyone coming from lakes to see it. We'll have a big signage, red gum on there. And we're going to have the kids thing finished. We'll have the upstairs room done. Like, and we're going to have a big welcome. We're going to have an opening, a grand opening to the building. And we'll invite the mayor. We'll invite Tim Bull. We'll get the Bansdale advertiser here. We'll have a whole list of gifts. Gifts will gifts, guests, will invite pastors from other churches. Now, they probably won't be able to come because it's a Sunday, but there will be people that we invite that don't really want to come and they'll make excuses. That's fine. But if no one came, like happened in the banquet, that would be devastating. And so when no one came to this banquet, it compelled a change of strategy. And, and what this strategy involved, the thing that blew everything apart, was that no one could ever have imagined that it would involve deliberately gathering the poor, the crippled, the blind and the lame. They are real life beggars. They're the most neglected social outcasts in that society. And that must have caused such shock and awe to the extreme as those who are hearing what Jesus is saying. Because there's, there's no government money for taxis. There's no NDIS. There's no... There's no support workers. And when the host says, 
go out and lead in, it's literal. Blind people can't see where to go. Someone has to lead them. Lame, crippled people, they don't have any way of getting there other than being carried. Wheelchairs don't exist. Poor people don't have money for public transport. Someone has to go and pick them up and bring them. See, the, Jesus told a story of a, of a Samaritan and, and he's called good because he used his own donkey, he didn't use the church's donkey. He used his own money to make a difference in someone's life. And, and when Jesus is, is telling a story, it's really important to ask yourself this question. Who am I in the story? See, the host is God the Father. The servants are the ones who go out and lead in, in obedience to the Father. The other people in the story are the first-time responders. And so when you ask yourself, who am I in the story? If you're thinking to yourself, well, I'm not blind and I'm not lame and not disabled, I don't fit in the story because I'm a good person. I'm a nice person. I'm not desperate like that. Well, I just want to encourage you with, with, with one more thing before I finished. And that's, I hope this will make you feel a little bit better. Because Jesus retold the story, but a variation on it. And instead of it being a banquet, it's a wedding feast. And it's found in Matthew 22. But once again, all the guests don't come. Once again, the host comes up with a new strategy. And he sends his servants in the streets, and this is what it says, gather all the people, gather all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good. Now, the old NIV switched that around and put, gather all the good and the bad as well. And some translations do that because it sounds so much more palatable. Go out and invite the good and also the bad. But the original says, go out and invite the bad and also the good. Not, not, the, not the lame, not the broken, not the poor. This time, go out and gather the bad people and the good people. And just to be clear so you know what Jesus meant by bad and good, bad is not referring to your personal character. Bad is referring to the choices you've made in life that have caused pain and damage to you or to other people. And good is referring to people who are just nice, joyful, happy, pleasant to be around, just a lovely nature. Our community is filled with lots and lots of nice people. People that have made choices that have caused trauma and damage and pain to them and other people. People who are marginalised, that are crippled, that are blind, that, that are very broken. And in these two stories, it's a description of every one of us in these two stories. And it's, in, it's an invitation that goes out to lead in to village life, to what we're doing here today. Because this is the bride. This is, this is how Jesus does it today. He does it through a local church. Just before I do finish, I want to go back to the man that Jesus healed that had been a cripple for 38 years. Jesus inspired him and he healed him but don't, don't miss this. This is what Jesus did not do. Jesus did not look at this man by the pool of Bethesda and he did not say, you're a dirty, rotten sinner going to hell. You need God's forgiveness to get to heaven. Jesus did not do that. In fact, 
Jesus never called anyone ever a sinner. I'll, I'll preach a message on it one day, but, but nowhere in the Bible does Jesus call anyone a sinner. He is criticised for hanging out with sinners, but that was religious people that were condemning those people and they used that word to put people down that Jesus was hanging out with. But Jesus didn't do that. He always inspired. He led this man to a banquet where healing and wholeness took place. But watch this. Later, Jesus went and privately found the man and had a very honest conversation with him. And he, and he said to him, the choices that you've been making in your life have actually are the cause for this pain and sorrow and stuff you've been through for the 38 years. Don't keep doing that. Because something worse could come upon you. He's, he healed him and then he showed him what was the cause of it and how not to get back into that place again. I think that's the sort of person that Jesus was describing when he said about bad people. People that make choices that impact their world. And I had done that. I had lost everything we owned through the choices that I'd made. And so in early 92, God recommissioned me to start a youth ministry in Bansdale. So on the 20th of March, 1992, we began a thing called Solid Rock. And Charlie, you were there that first night playing guitar. We had Plucker cat instead of pluck a duck which stole a whole lot of stuff off hey hey it's saturday and we began with not one youth kid we had we had no one because when i walked away from what god had called me to do a youth ministry we, we lost all the youth in the church and, and they were gone so we're starting with nothing and so how do you do that well i went to the high school and asked can we hand out promos to the kids in the school? And they said, no, you can't. I said, well, can you stop me if we stand on the outside of the school ground and give out flyers to the kids? They said, no, we can't stop you doing that. So we did that. So we surrounded the school. We, there's 1,200 kids in the school. We surrounded it. We gave out all these promos to this youth group we're starting. And I'll never forget watching kids get these coloured bits of paper they're on their bikes, they're walking, whatever. And they get them and they screwed them up and threw them on the ground. And, and wherever they went, where the bikes had gone, there's just this coloured paper. There's paper everywhere. And I thought, I'm never going to have a kid screw up one of my promos ever again. And it never did. I found ways to overcome that problem. But 7 o'clock, 7 o'clock we started on Friday night. It was actually 7.30. And 7.30, not one kid came. It's our first night. We've got a band. We've got everything ready. Not one kid came. Quarter to eight, 63 kids walked in the door. And within three weeks, we had 100 kids. And over the next six and a half years of that youth ministry, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of kids. Every year, there was at least about 200 kids. That's 10% of Bansdale called that place their home. All the Koori kids, a whole generation of Koori kids in Bansal at that stage, every one of them were part of this youth ministry. And that led to a high school program that we ran where we gathered 500 kids every lunchtime in the Bark Auditorium. We started a youth church. Eventually, we left Bansal, went to Sydney, ran big high school events in Sydney, um, gathered whole school assemblies and presented the gospel to thousands of kids every week in very creative ways and we, we started church we planted church for nine years and and then we came back to Bansdale and started red gum all of that is because Jesus invited me to a banquet where I could be healed from the choices that I'd caused grief upon our family losing everything we owned and he recommissioned me to be here today 
That's the power of going and leading, inspiring others. And you're going to see amazing fun as God uses this, just a, it's a shell, it's a building, but he uses us to go and inspire. And it's going to be an adventure. And I'm so thankful that we can do it together. I really am. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that you're the God of second chances and third chances. And right now I want to pray for Jamie. Jamie, you're watching this in, in northern New South Wales. And we spoke together for the first time ever yesterday. And you're an Aboriginal woman. And your life has been a series of decisions that have caused you grief sometimes and grief to others. I just want to pray for you now, Lord. I want to pray for Jamie. She needs your help. She needs your strength. There's just so much hurt and brokenness that she's experienced in life. And you love her and you care for her. I thank you the way you've just put us together in this random way yesterday. And, and I thank you, Father, for everyone. We all have a story. And you, your story in, intersects our story and you inspire us. And you call us to a better future, something that's way better than our current reality. And I thank you for that. Help us to be the ones that would be willing to care enough to go and make a difference in someone's life. Thank you, Jesus. Do you want to do that last song you did, the third song? Yep, that'd be great. Let's stand and sing of how faithful... And good God is to us, even when we make choices that contradict what he wants for us. Good 
this is running after It's running after me In my life laid down I surrendered now I can give you everything Your goodness is running after It's running after me just hang around, have a tea, coffee, Bonox, Milo, Oval Team, whatever we've got there and, and say good day to someone and pretend you've been here forever. In all my life you have been Goodness of God. 